composer, vocalist, multi-instrumental electronic musician and multimedia artist, Christine Wheeler spans an array of styles and forms. She blends a mix of songs and improvised electronic music from vocals, sampler, theremin, cue chord, auto harp and array in Bira. A Los Angeles native, Wheeler has performed and recorded with a variety of artists, including Ryoichi Sakamoto, Shaka Khan, John Cale, Leveraji, Roscoe Mitchell, Art Ensemble of Chicago, Matana Roberts, Mark Rebo, Murkoff and a guy called Gerald. Wheeler's work with David Byrne included international tours and appearances on The Late Show with David Letterman and PBS's sessions at West 54th Street. Um, MTV's AMP featured her music. Uh, recordings include work with Fred P, Benjamin Brunn, Shine Doe, Ripperton, Vernon Reed, DJ Logic, Mocky and Jamie Liddell. Her duo with Nicole Mitchell, Iridescent, opened the um, Angel City Jazz Festival. And next she will release two albums, Songs of S and D and um, Tres S and Numeral, <laughs> Magical. Um, kaleidoscopic triptychs. Um, wow, so amazing um, career path you've had already so far, Christina, and really looking forward to um, hearing your talk. Thanks for being here with us. Okay, Annie, thank you so much for inviting me to join everybody and welcome everybody that's here in the class. I um, like to keep things really pretty um, open and not just talk at everybody the whole time. So if you do have any questions, you know, please don't hesitate to speak up. Um, maybe put them in the chat. If I don't see them, somebody can say, oh, we have questions. I really want to keep this very open so we can have a great dialogue together. Um, now, I understand that we've got a whole range of people, including um, the general public, potentially in addition to students. So I'm going to keep my talk pretty broad, um, but there will also be some tech moments. And for the people who are very tech oriented, please don't hesitate to ask any super nerdy questions because we love nerds and we love nerdy questions. So, so I'm going to get started and give you a little background about me. So, um, as a bio said, I was born and raised in Los Angeles, and I grew up in a household of musician parents. So um, my mom was trained as a classical operatic singer, and I have a um, stepfather who's a jazz trumpet player. So it was always assumed that I would do music. Um, I always had um, more interests and never really had the patience at the time to learn instruments, but I always sang and danced and acted and performed. You know, in high school did everything from musicals to choir to madrigals to gospel choirs um, and was trying to get into dance clubs when I was in high school before there were really club kids. So um, from there for university, I went to Harvard and I didn't study music. I studied art history and African-American studies, but I was also doing musical theater, taking voice lessons. Um, when I finished uh, there, I moved to New York City. Um, spent a little bit of time trying to figure out what I was going to do for a year and then decided to get a master's degree, which I did at um, Manhattan School of Music, which is one of the conservatories there. So um, over time, I, you know, kind of saturated with, you know, obscure, obscure jazz songs and then <clears throat> ended up having this pivotal performance at New Music America Festival with John Carter, who was a mentor of mine since I was a child. Um, so um, I ended up having to do a third year in my master's program and I decided to be an unofficial composition major. So I was studying orchestration, conducting film scoring, electronic music, songwriting. So I developed through this a lot of very broad skill sets. Um, in the first year that I was out from conservatory, I had an experimental jazz band that I wrote compositions for, and I played more um, contemporary jazz composers like Ornette Coleman and Charles Mingus. Um, I wanted to get more work, so I decided to branch out into um, electronics. Um, and uh, I got one multi effects unit and started a duo with Nina Mankin. Uh, so um, Nina and I started this duo called My Wiremouth. We recorded an EP, got featured in the Village Voice, and then Nina decided to quit and move to Nashville to write country songs, and I completely fell in love with electronics. So my first sampler transformed uh, my life. Finally, I could push a button and make a sound as easily as opening my mouth to sing. Um, I did sets with a uh, sampler and two digital echoplexes, and then I got a theremin. And so that I could do duets with myself while I was singing. And then I got a cue chord because it was easy to play when my hands were full with um, other um, with other buttons and knobs and 
sliders and things that I was doing. So um, from there I kept gigging in New York City and then I finally got the spring break when I was invited to join David Byrne's t touring band for two years. Um, I had my own section in the show um, where I was featured with my electronic setup and I did this gig for a couple, two years, that finished. I came back and kept working on my own solo sets, moving more into the um, dance music world, but a little more experimental with that music. So um, then there was a night I was scheduled to open for Matthew Herbert in New York City, and this night happened to be 9-11. Everything changed after that. Um, I uh, became physically sick from the smoke. I got PTSD, writer's block, and decided it was time to leave New York. So I made plans to move to Berlin and um, then transferred my U.S. Um, residence to Los Angeles. So after that time, I slowly got back to doing work in Berlin, doing vocals for house and techno producers. Um, I then started to get more musical instruments and my current creative practice um, started to crystallize. So um, I'm just gonna do a little quote, which is from an artist statement, and it'll kind of give you a sense of what I do now. So um, for much of my um, professional career as an electronic artist, my work is engaged with the conundrum of the seeming perfection of the linearity of the binary form combined with the irregularity of human touch and expression and what happens in the spaces when these worlds combine, conflate, and collapse together. So over the last recent years, my musical expression has diversified to include new musical instruments that um, explore a broad range of materials and how they resonate in space when manipulated by electronic processing, with a spectrum of sound ranging from the acoustic to the analog to binary realms and the new color palettes that are created when these um, worlds merge in, um, into new timbral territories. Instrument materials include the voice, which is flesh, obviously, um, glass and water for glass harmonica, um, the metal tines of a nimbira, the strings of, a harmo of an auto harp, um, digital touch plates that um, I utilize on an iPad to control um, iOS apps, um, a cue chord, which also has a strum plate, and I do extended playing techniques like that, um, air and space and sensors, which is how a theremin works, um, and again, like I said, more iOS apps on the iPad. So these recent sounds um, inform new music compositions rooted in my multi-stylistic background um, with elements of ambient, rhythmic, and improvisational music combined to create fresh amalgamated forms. Um, I'm now also developing multimedia and generative installation uh, pro projects. So I think now would be a good time to uh, take out the um, slides that I um, brought to show the different kinds of instruments that I play. So if we could bring that up, because I find that it's easier to actually see them and then I can talk about them a little bit more. Okay, so this is the very first um, instrument that I got. It is a theremin and it um, is created by the Moog company. So um, for people who aren't aware, the way that a theremin works is that there's a bar and if you can you scroll down to the end because I might have another one in there that's actually set up this is mm, no nah, that's okay well we'll get to that that's a different one but let's go back to the the first theremin that I was showing you um, in the beginning so it's gonna look like that so that round bar goes on the side and then the long bar in the middle gets set up to the top so what happens is your hands are up here and you've got this round bar here which controls how loud or soft the instrument is, and you can use that to make vibrato. And then your hand is up here, and then you move your hand relative to a bar that's up like this, and as you get closer to the bar, the tone gets higher, and as you get farther back, the tone gets lower. So one of the things that I've been doing, like I was saying in the description, is I'm really interested in um, the way different materials resonate in space and then what happens with those materials when you process them through electronics. So the theremin, uh, is the, I think it is, the first electronic instrument. And what it does is it produces a sine wave, which is quite simple. But the thing that's cool about a sine wave, it's very simple. So it means you can do all kinds of manipulation of it. So I have been doing um, extended technique work with a theremin for a long time. So what I'll do, say, is take the, um, 
the tone button and bring the bass way far up and then uh, go on a mixing board and then turn that even more bass up and then run that through electronics so you get these massive rumbling low end kind of drone sounds that can come out of it so that was one of the things that i would do but i also love the flexibility that with my voice you know because I've done all kinds of music and, and singing, including experimental singing and extended vocal techniques, um, that means that I can both sing and play the instrument at the same time and do duets with myself. So this is one instrument. Um, the next one that we can move to is the one that you were at before, which was actually the theremini. That white one, yeah. So this is actually a new development from the Moog company. It is a virtual digital variation on the original theremin. It's called a theremini, and you can uh, set it for um, a variety of notes. You can play it like the traditional one, but you can also set it for any one of the notes in the 12-tone scale. You can also select a variety of modes from um, you know, traditional ones like, you know, Ionian, Dorian, Phrygian, etc. Then they have all kinds of other uh, different uh, modes that come from different areas of the world and you can use those as well. Um, the instrument also has a variety of effects. So what I do with it is I run it through one effect in the, or I, whichever one that I want to use in the actual theremini, and then I further process it in the laptop so that it becomes something really quite different. Um, I am looking to have a little more flexibility with the instrument and I've been in talks with Moog about seeing if there's a way that they can hack it to let it give me more control when I'm playing with a MIDI controller. So that's my hope for coming up um, in the future with playing the instrument. So um, the next one that we can go to is back at the top, which is the auto harp. So uh, actually, yeah, let's start there. So the auto harp is a... Um, really traditional instrument. It comes from the zither and um, you can either play it on a table or you can hold it in your arms. Um, you get very different kinds of gestures with it depending on how you have it um, situated. So when I have it sitting on a table then I find that the gesture is a little more delicate. If I'm actually holding it in my arms I can like really kind of dig into the strings and get a lot more texture that way. So this particular instrument is an electronic version and what that means is that it has a pickup on the inside and what I do is I take the sound and I process it through a variety of guitar pedals. Um, the three that I primarily use are from um, Electroharmonics, one that is called um, a Big Muff and then I also have um, an, uh, what is this here, an even tight space pedal and I also have an electroharmonics memory man that I do different kinds of looping and manipulating the sound with that. So the nice thing about the auto harp is that um, where say like a guitar has six strings, I have 36 strings. So it has fulfilled this um, you know, desire that I had for a very long time to kind of be my own shoegazer band. So I can get like big, huge walls of sound. I can also um, do very extended um, technique playing. The instrument itself, the buttons that you're seeing, if you press them and then you strum, you get chords. The chords are very pretty simple, so you can either get um, a series of major triad chords or minor triad chords or dominant seven chords. Now, um, what that does is it very specifically references um, folk music and pop music. Um, the thing that I like about what I do with the instrument is with all of the effects processing that I do, um, or let me backtrack a smidge. So when you press down a button, what the way that it works is there are felt dampeners under each button that's connected to a bar. And when you press down on that button, it dampens out all of the strings that um, are not a part of the chord that you want to hear. However, those strings are there. And you can get kind of ghost overtones of them. So one of the things that I like to do with the processing is really get some interesting microtones that'll come with how the instrument is played and how it's heard. So on the one hand, you feel like you're referencing these traditions of folk music and pop music, but then you've got all these other very dissonant things that are happening at the same time. Sometimes I will um, not use the bars at all and I'll just pluck individual notes and I can get um, very, um, you know, 12 tone scale kind of things. 
um, the electronic processing can give me microtonal things, and sometimes even I will do extended technique playing where instead of playing the instrument on the top part that you're seeing, I'll go all the way to that section on the bottom where there are fine tuners, and um, I'll like make little clicking and you know pulling sounds in there. So I really try and mine the instrument uh, depending on what I'm doing with it for what um, the possibilities are. Um, yeah, so uh, that's that instrument. Now let's go up actually backwards to the purple one that's above there. So if we could um, open up on that one a little bit, that would be great. So what we're looking at here now is by um, the company Suzuki and it's called a Q chord. So this is a virtual digital version of the auto harp that was made by Suzuki for people who um, may not necessarily have skill sets. So on this instrument, instead of having uh, major triads, minor triads, and dominant chords, the palette harmonically is extended. So here you can get those triads and dominants, but you can also get major seventh chords, minor seventh chords, uh, the dominant seven chords, of course, and then you can also get diminished and augmented chords. So there's a little more flexibility there, and you have all 12 tones of the scale. Um, you don't have all um, chords on the traditional auto harp. You have some, but not all. On this instrument, you have all 12. In addition, the instrument also has um, pre-saved uh, drum lines and bass lines. So if you turn on the instrument, you might think it sounds kind of corny. But what I do with it is I'm always kind of hacking it and mining it and finding other things to do with it. So this includes that the vertical part that you see with the lines, that is a strum plate. And so in the way that say like you would strum a guitar, there you run your fingers along it like this and um, you get sounds. So that's not all I do with it. Sometimes I touch in different places to get notes. Other times I will do some extended technique playing where I'll really press on to it and really use it against uh, the effects that I have set up, say, in a software program like Ableton Live, where I'll daisy chain together multiple um, plugins and really mine it to have it do things that it's not anticipated or it's what's supposed to do. I will even sometimes um, turn on the drum part pitch it down like super super slow and then I'll send that through a whole bunch of different um, atypical kind of uh, delays so that I get really weird rhythmic patterns that'll happen. Um, so this instrument is really fun that way. Again, the, one of the things that makes it easier is when um, I'm playing, if I've got my hands full with doing something, because I tend to do a lot of solo work, which means that I'm kind of controlling everything at the same time. So oftentimes, and the reason why I got this instrument initially was that my hands would be free, full because I would be triggering um, samples by hand on a controller, and I needed to have... Um, something that I could e easily access without having to pick up an instrument. Um, so that's why I picked that one. And then from there, I actually ended up moving backwards to the original one. After all the talk that I told you about how I didn't have like the patience as a kid um, to sit and learn instruments um, and why these things with buttons are kind of appealing to me, now that I have um, you know, finally expanded um, my multi-instrumental palette and I have all these different instruments. Now I'm finally doing that kind of classic thing which is somebody who sings and plays a harmonic instrument at the same time. However, there's a lot of other territory that I cover with those as well. So, um, but moving on to more instruments that um, are part of the vocabulary palette. Um, let's move now to um, the Imbira, which is underneath the auto harp. And if we could pull open on that, I'll talk about this. So this is a custom instrument. It's made by a company called Array, which is based in San Francisco. And it is a four octave, 12 tone electric Imbira. So what it does is if you'll see the, the direction that you're looking at it from is if you were facing me. So when I'm playing it, I'm on the other side of the instrument from where the two stereo jack inputs are that you can see on your screen. And um, then it's played like a traditional Embira, except it's not a traditional Embira. Uh, it's got all 12 tones, it's got four octaves, and um, the 
guys who designed and built the instrument decided that because the tines resonate on the overtone series that it would sound best if the tines were placed um, next to each other in circles of fifths. So what does that exactly mean? That means when you play the instrument, you have, let's see, I've got mine here, maybe this is loud enough you can hear. So let's say this is C. You'll have C, three, four, five, six, next to one another. And then you'll have G, because it's all set up in circles of fifths. So then you'll have G, and then you'll have D, and then you'll have A. So it's interesting because what you have on the left side actually replicates what you have on the right side in terms of your note choices. So what makes this instrument cool is that you've got stereo outputs. You can take the sound from the left side and play one note and process it in one different way and then play the same note on the other side and process it in a completely different kind of way. And usually the closest approximation I could come for the harmonic organization of this is the buttons on an accordion, because I think those are also placed in circles of fifths from what I understand. I've never played accordion. Um, but what makes the, this instrument kind of challenging is that if you're playing a keyboard, um, everything kind of goes from low to high in chromatic steps. Whereas here, um, some chords lend themselves to sounding really nice here. Like you can do something like this, and then you can just move over. So those things are relatively easy, but if you want to start writing um, more atypical, complex chords, um, I have to end up designing and creating kind of like my own score. So a little anecdote, when I was working with the Art Ensemble of Chicago, Roscoe Mitchell gave me um, these beautiful scores that went with a game piece, and they were written for keyboard. So I had to take them and literally look at like each um, chord each note on um, the score and figure out on my part, um, okay, we've got these notes here, here, how am I going to play this? Now how am I going to get to the next one? So it can be kind of complex um, when it comes to notated music, I have to make my own scores. But when um, it is improvised music, there's a lot more flexibility. Oftentimes what I'll do is some extended technique playing on this as well. So those little tiny tines that you hear, that you can see that are where the longer tines are connected in by the board there, um, they don't really have a sound that's tonal like these. But what they do have is an interesting kind of clicking sound. And I'll take that sometimes and I'll then process that in a different kind of way and it can make for some really cool sounds. So I do have a broad range on this instrument. I can play pretty songs, I can play complex things, I can do extended technique playing with processing. It can do some really cool, beautiful things. And so I love the flexibility of this instrument for that particular reason. So, okay, so um, let's move down. And uh, let's go to the little shots, screenshots of the iPad apps. So the, this is another app. It kind of mimics um, the cue chord. And it's nice because um, you have both the buttons of the chords that you can um, touch and trigger. And you also have a kind of a keyboard looking strum plate on the side. And you also have a whole variety of different parameters that you can change and affect in terms of sine waves, all kinds of you know traditional parts of um, you know uh, sound synthesis, and make choices about how you want the instrument to sound when you play. Um, I've been talking to the developer. He hasn't gotten around to it, but one of the hacks that I asked if he would um, consider doing, which he says is part of his plan, he just hasn't done it yet, is to give the player the flexibility to put whatever chords they want into the buttons instead of following the format that he's given. So that's one instrument. It does harmonic things, which is quite nice, but I can play individual tones on the key back, keyboard on the right side. So underneath that is another um, app. And uh, I'm trying to see what the name of this is. I don't have that on here. Let me see. Well, let me see if I can 
Yeah, I don't want to fuss with it. I'll tell you afterwards. I'll look and see when we take five. Um, it says, um, this one is sound prison. Yeah, that's what it is. I'll, I'll hear it. That's another harmonic one. You can you know set it up in different ways. You can play it in different ways. I send all this stuff through processing, so it sounds quite different than what's actually in the app. Um, and then there's another app that I use. It's underneath this one in the next. And this also is, again, another keyboard option. And again, I process this through a lot of electronics. So I'm really interested in taking, you know, the things that are there. My general motto in kind of creating is, you know, as the, I don't know if they have this saying in the UK. In the US, they have a saying, at least my family is originally from the Deep South, from Louisiana. And so they have a saying called, don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. Um, which, I don't know if you guys say that where you are. But what it means is, like, don't get rid of perfectly good things just to throw things out. So, um, yeah, uh, so I, I use everything and I'm not, you know, a rigorous dogma person. Like there's, a, you know, only this one particular way that I can work and full respect to people that, you know, they've got their, you know, manifestos and things right on. That's awesome. Um, but that's not how I work. I'm really a maximalist and I just like, like to have access to anything and everything sonic wise, palette wise, concept wise, as I'm working at any particular point in time. So uh, next, moving down uh, to the next instrument, which is the latest uh, instrument that I got, if we can go underneath here, I uh, have a glass harmonica. Um, so this is an instrument that was originally created by Benjamin Franklin, who was in addition uh, to many other kind of polymath roles that he had in his life, he created musical instruments. So what he did was he took an old fashioned sewing machine that had a foot pedal and he took the sewing machine part off, left the wheel part on, got these bowls, bored holes through the middle, thread them through a um, pole, connected it to the sewing machine and then started spinning the bowls around and put water on them and played them with his hands. So in uh, 2022, fortunately, we have uh, machines and mechanisms. So you turn on um, a motor, and the motor takes the instrument and it spins it, and you put water on your fingers, and you put water all over the instrument, and then you get it at the right speed. That's a bigger one. It's not mine, but I wanted to show you also somebody playing it. And um, then you uh, can see these gold kind of... Um, these gold uh, bars that are on the side. So those gold bars replicate the black notes that you would see on um, a keyboard. So the lowest bowl there is an F, and then you can see there's you know F sharp, G sharp, A sharp next to that, and then it goes up into another octave. I think mine's like two or two and a half. I'd have to sit and count how many bowls. I didn't get, I got a custom one. So, um, and you can, they're made by a company called Finkenbeiner, that's based in Western Massachusetts and not Western, but outside of the suburbs west of Boston proper. Um, they're in Waltham. And, um, but what I'm doing with the instrument is I have two capsule microphones uh, to take stereo input of the sound. And then I'm then processing this instrument through electronics. And I have to say, when you hear this process through electronics, it really sounds like nothing you've ever heard before. It's really amazing. Um, I am working on developing um, a variety of different uh, projects and compositions with the instrument. And the first one that I'm working on is a composition for glass harmonica, voice, uh, string quartet, playing through effects pedals that they can manipulate themselves in real time. Um, I've decided to expand the instrumentation. Now I want to have Quora, which will probably be processed through electronics and my Ambira. Um, and uh, effects and uh, samples, sound design, all kinds of stuff like that. So um, when I was a kid, you know, people used to say, well, what do you do? Do you this, do this, or you, do you do that? And I had people who called me a dilettante because I had all these different in interests. And it was very, you know, freeing and liberating when finally, you know, folks started using, which is maybe a little bit hackneyed at this point, but they use the term polymath because that has really, you know, encompassed what I do at this point. So um, now I'm gonna, uh, well, you know, let me take a little quick moment to ask, does anybody have, I'm going to go to the chat and see if I can see this. Um, does anybody have any questions 
or things that they want to ask me at this point because I've been talking for a good bit and I'm going to then move on into talking about my current practice right now and some other um, projects that I'm doing, especially around um, immersive multimedia pieces. So anybody want to ask me anything about the instruments or things like that? Is everybody good? Michael has helpfully been putting in loads of links to things. So I think oh, that's people lovely. have been so able to explore things a bit themselves. But yeah, does anyone have any questions for Christina in the interim? Because I got pretty nerdy there. So people might want to say, well, what about this? And what about that? And how about this? How about that? I'm super open. Ask me whatever you want. Anything. Anybody? Alicia, does that mean you want to ask something? Can you see that question? Have you tried the Bachet? Bachet, yeah. Um, actually, um, Thomas Block is really kind of one of the, if not the preeminent, don't, don't sit down, let me put that, not put absolutes, because there are a lot of, there are some really amazing glass harmonica players, but he is one of the preeminent. Um, uh, glass harmonic players. And he also has the Bechet instrument. That is another glass instrument. It's got these um, kind of, uh, not tubes, because I don't own one and I've never had a chance to play one, but it has these glass um, kind of rods and you put water on those. So, and then they're connected to metal. Um, I don't know if anybody if anybody has time and they can find one online, you might find it cool to um, check out what those look like as well. So, okay, I'm looking in the chat now and uh, let's see. Yeah, Kai's got a question. I'll read it out in case people can't see the chat. How did you settle on the equipment you use in your practice? Was it trial and error or just picking stuff and learning what you could do with it? Each, each instrument had a different story. Um, with the first one that I got, what, which was um, the theremin, honestly, it was because it was easy. Like, that's why I want to kind of like demystify all this, you know, for the kid who was like the child of two musicians, where it was never a matter like, do you want to learn an instrument, but which one are you going to learn to play? And then as a kid, like, I just didn't have the patience. I had a cello. I loved my cello. I still have a cello. I still love my cello. But, you know, the virtuosity that goes with the instrument singing was different because I literally learned to sing while I was learning to talk. So it's very like in the body, it's very, you know, visceral. Um, it's something that's with me all the time. So that was never like a challenge because I learned to start doing it, you know, since before I could remember. But the instruments themselves, that was a challenge for me initially. I don't know, just like some kids are good with being patient with that stuff like that. Other people may not necessarily be. So when I got the theremin, I liked it because I could just sit there and put my hands up and get sound. What I loved about the sampler was that I was liberated from these narrow boxes of what kind of music do you do? Do you do this or do you do that or do, you do that? And then when I got a sampler and I could just pull the bits of the things that I loved, because I wasn't taking long samples. I was taking short things, manipulating them, layering them, and then making them sound really different than where they came from. And it was beautiful because I was free. I was free to just like express myself, take all my interests in, put them all together. And I love doing that. And it's still very um, much a part of when I do song based sets, I'll do interludes in between songs and I'll do those kind of improvised sections with those. Um, the um, Imbira. I ended up getting, well, let me rewind a bit because I don't want to repeat myself too much. So like I said, the cue chord I got because my hands were full when I was playing sampler by hand at the time, and I needed something that I could just touch it and get a chord that I wanted to put in, so that made that easier. Then once I had that for a while, I was like, what would it sound like if I went back to the source? Because here's an auto harp and it still has buttons and I can press those. So then I went to there and then, you know, I always loved pedals and decided I was gonna try and be my own personal shoegazer band. And so that was really fun and exciting, but I don't just use the pedals. I'll use pedals and I'll use further plugins in the um, laptop. So it's a real broad range of, you know, manipulation of sound. The Imbira, I saw it on, online and I loved it. And then I found out that a um, colleague of mine uh, Madeline Bloom, who's super brilliant, shout out to Mads. She is based in um, Berlin and she has a great website called Sonic Bloom. If you want to check out uh, her website, she's a master Ableton Live person and has got amazing great tips on there. So in any case, Madeline had the acoustic version of the Imbira in a box and I had, um, I 
looked at the website and saw there were other ones and I knew I wanted to do more electronic things with it. So I went down, actually drove down to San Diego, met up with the guys, hung out, you know, played nine different in uh, inversions of the Embarrass that were set up for me, found the one that spoke to me and that was the one that I got. So that's how I got that one. Um, the iPad was again things that I could, once I started finding apps that I liked, and I've tried tons and tons of apps, and it mostly just goes by what I like, the sound that feels good to me, what's inspiring for me, what I like working with, um, like that. With the Theremini, I got that because um, I'd already been playing Theremin for a very, very long time, and then they brought out this new vert, this new iteration and I wanted to try that and so I've been working with that for a while and again the glass harmonica by then I'd kind of figured out that there was something going on with my practice um, because I had to start writing artist statements I really wasn't initially even kind of envisioning myself as somebody who was in you know kind of institutional music making world or academia world I mean and I will say this like, and I say this, you know, very regularly, I am very proud and a continued practitioner, if I'm using kind of a fussy word, but I still very happily make vocals for house and techno tracks. I'm very much still in the dance music community. That is my community. Um, and I'm very much committed to that music as well, because I don't feel like there's only one place that I get to do what I do. I want to do whatever I want to do whenever I want to do it. Um, so out of writing, you know, having to turn around and then, you know, end up back in more institutional places, they want artist statements, you got to write your artist statement. I'm like, well, what do I do? And I'm like, okay, well, if I'm going to kind of figure out what is it that I do, then I started looking and I realized, oh, it's really about these different kinds of manipulative processing. And um, it is uh, about how the instruments resonate in space. So the glass harmonica came from there. I saw one online. I was like, I bet that's going to sound cool. Then I went out to the company in uh, outside of Boston. I said, can you set one up? Can I try it? They're like, yeah, sure, you can come out. And then I tried it, and I completely fell in love with the sound because I brought my laptop with me, did some processing just through the internal speaker. And I'm like, this is insane. This is amazing. I love this. So, um, you know, did what I had to do to get one. That's an instrument, and I still fantasize about new things. I never get tired of new instruments. Um, I, one thing I've been kind of fantasizing about uh, that I may get onto one day is to have something made out of some sort of like ceramics. Don't know what that's going to be. I've thought about maybe finding a ceramicist who can, you know, make little things that maybe I can take a toy piano and, you know, hack it take the metal things apart out of it in the inside and maybe add some ceramic things. I don't know. It's it's down the line. I've got plenty of work to do with stuff that I have right now. So that's definitely uh, keeping um, my plate very full. Um, yeah, and one other thing I'd say about the instruments is that I'm also very interested in how um, the dynamic physical gesture affects the expression of sound. So different instruments function differently in terms of the body's dynamic movement in space. And that you can see, like, when I'm playing the, um, let's see, I'm going to stand up and look a little bit for a minute. But when I'm standing up, like, and I'm playing, I can pull down like this on these tines. When I've got the auto harp in my hands, I can, you know, really kind of dig in this way. But if it's in front of me on a, on a table, I can just kind of, like, pluck on the strings that way. Um, I can press into strum plates, but each thing really changes um, how uh, the sound comes out in space. And that has been a part of my own kind of creative um, practice journey as well, is um, talking about sound and space. Um, let's see. So I'm going to circle back to some of the notes that I had here. So. Um, the current projects that I'm working on right now are, um, I've got these solo uh, song-based music projects. Um, so they, they are usually song cycle series. They explore larger connecting themes. Um, they're performed live. Um, and then with down tempo and ambient and interstitial interludes between the songs. So the instrumentation includes voice, software processed electric four octave 12 tone vera hardware processed electric auto harp software processed q chord various i os apps um i over the lockdown started up a record label um, it's called bambula audio and uh i in november put out an ep 
called uh, That Was Then, This Is Now. And it is the prequel to an album uh, that is coming out at the end of March called Songs of S Plus D. And the first single for the album is called Asleep at the Wheel, and it actually went live yesterday. So you can go um, to uh, ChristinaWheeler.com. You can go to ChristinaWheeler.BandCamp.com. That's actually a better place to go. Um, when I get a minute, when we take a break, I'll put a link in. Um, Ocarina is cool. The reason why I've never done um, blowing instruments is because I tend to sing while um, I am performing, or I'd like to have that option. Um, let's see, one thing that I didn't show is that I have these two looping devices, which I've had for a long time, called um, Oberheim Echoplexes. So I don't carry them out so much, but they are really fun when I'm recording in the studio to use those, and I'll do all kinds of recording extended techniques. I'll take them out sometimes if I can. I happen to have them here with me in Paris right now, and um, it's nice because I can basically do anything with my voice. I can make melodies, I can loop and make harmonies, I can add beats, I can make textures, I can make things that I call sonic glazes, which don't fit into any of those categories, but they um, are kind of like colors that um, I can add to a soundscape. And when they're there, they change the feeling of uh, the sonic feeling of the space. So um, that's what I do with the songs. Um, I also do solo instrumental music. Um, so these are non-song based comp compositions that utilize the previous mentioned instrumentation. Um, they frequently utilize extended notation techniques and um, I will add in, depending on the piece, um, different elements maybe, you know, because the performance there might be something with fluxist kind of gestures, um, audience chance participation, um, I have a multimedia uh, performance piece called Tres es un Numero Magico, Kaleidoscopic Triptychs, and that's a three-part solo composition for audience-generated chance, order, and direction for voice, electric and vera, electric auto harp, cue chord, delay loops, and electronic effects processing. So um, that piece developed over time, and basically I was listening to a friend's wonderful trio album and kind of you know, saying, wow, I'm here alone, there's three people, they sound so great, and looking at three of my instruments and saying, well, could I be a trio by myself? So I started meditating on the number three, meditating on how triads are actually, or are sometimes looked down on as not being so interesting. So I gave myself these set of parameters and said, I'm gonna make a piece that's all about threes. And so I made this graphic score, and um, I realized once the score was done that I could actually play it it had, I ended up doing three versions of it, so it became a three-part piece, and then I realized that I could play the scores in any order, in any direction. So when I did the premiere of the piece at Sondland Hoffmann in Berlin, I decided, because it's an art space, to add, you know, some, um, some kind of fluxus, fluxus gesture, some audience participation, and I wrote a kind of meditation, incantation, uh, that became a spoken word piece at the beginning about choice and chance, and then I gave the audience to consider how they choose and how they play, and to choose, if they decided to, to think about it, do I choose to participate, and then whoever raised their hand, and they did, they closed their eyes, and then they put their hand in an envelope, and they picked out a number, and they got to determine in what order and in what direction I would play the piece. Um, I originally wrote it for a nine-speaker circular multi-array, and uh, in that iteration that was reduced to six, but ideally I'd like to do it in nine. Um, so uh, that's that piece. And then from there, what is really kind of occupying my time now and part of what I'm working on while I'm here Right now I'm in Paris. I'm at the Cité Internationale des Arts, which is an international artist residency. And um, I'm here working on uh, the Glass Harmonica piece, which I told you about, and also two different multimedia um, performance pieces. So, um, and uh, one of them also uh, converts into a generative installation project. So uh, let's see, um, I'll start with the generative one because that's interesting. The Magical Garden is a five-part performance generative installations uh, series 
Um, it utilizes live music, video, and LED lights from the performance that are then input into generative software to create a continuous uh, multimedia uh, presentation afterwards. So um, Issue Project Room uh, in Brooklyn, uh, they commissioned the first concert performance of part one. Um, Harvest Works Digital Media Arts Center um, selected me as an artist in residence for the generative technology development in 2016 and I have actually just recently been accepted to come back and continue or rather work on another portion section of the piece because there's five parts and uh, work on continuing to develop the generative software so that will, this will expand into the video and the LED lights. Um, the Magical Garden is a um, all ages piece. Um, it is an uh, um, allegorical story that's meant for everybody from uh, parents to kids to folks of all ages. And it's a pretty psychedelic story about five anthropomorphized animals that are trapped in a magical garden and they're trying to figure out how they're going to get out. So it's a meditation on also on freedom, how we determine what freedom is. I think freedom is an important issue these days. Um, it also is going to meditate on um, relations and how people engage with one another and also uh, how we engage with nature and our sense of control in terms of how we make gardens and uh, the larger universe that's out beyond these seeming confines. So that's one of the things I'm working on right now. Um, Tresis and Numero Magico is actually going to be the next uh, um, uh, album that's going to come out on my record label, so you can look out for that there. And um, I'm hoping to perform that piece more in the future. So I also collaborate with a lot of different people. So um, there's a long list if you go on the website, ChristinaWheeler.com, you can read that. But like the people that more recently right now that I'm working with, um, I've been uh, doing a duo work with Nicole Mitchell, uh, who is a part of her Black Earth music label. We have a duo called Iridescent. We've performed um, at uh, the Angel City Jazz Festival in Los Angeles, the Burlington Jazz Festival, and um, also at UC Irvine. Um, we have a record. I'm hoping to get that out. Um, I've done recording with Jeff Parker from the band Tortoise. Uh, more recordings I hope to get out. Um, I've worked with Chris Abrahams from The Nex. It's an amazing trio from Australia. If you don't know them, super highly recommended. Check them out. We've got more recordings to get out. Um, I was a guest with the Art Ensemble of Chicago for their 50th anniversary season. I was doing all the electronics for the group. It was a huge honor. And I'm also on uh, the record that they put out in honor of the occasion called uh, We Are on the Edge. Um, so you can find that on Pi Recordings. Um, and uh, I'll think of the other, because it's a joint issue. Um, I'll think of it in a minute. Um, I've done work with Martin Roberts playing in her sextet uh, for the Berlin Jazz Fest Berlin. Um, I convened a quartet with Laraji, um, ambient music maestro Vernon Reed from Living Color, Abdu Boop, who is a um, master Senegalese uh, percussionist and choral player, and H Prism, who used to be priest from an anti pop consortium. Uh, and those are the more recent projects. I had a project called The Call with um, Satch Hoyt and our dearly departed Greg Tate, who recently uh, transitioned last month. And so that was very special that I got to work with him during our lifetimes. So uh, let's see what else. Um, does anybody have any questions? I'm really sensitive about not talking, talking too much, and I really want to engage with you and find out any other ideas you have. I'm also interested in what you're working on, the things that you're curious about, um, so that we really can have a, a lovely group um, conversation together. So does anybody have anything else that's come to mind that they're thinking about, anything about their own practice that they're wondering about, anything about their own compositions, their own sound design they're thinking about? What's going on? Anybody? Anyone wants to share? Um, Lara had a comment before, I think, around when you were talking about ceramics, and Lara says there's some very beautiful ceramic flutes around yeah. ocarinas. I yeah, I saw that, and I love ocarinas. Um, if any of you are familiar with Claire Chase, she's a master flute player, and she also has um, 
uh, she's doing a commission series of, um, what's it called, Density 3026, and she just recently had uh, another um, iteration of that long-term project that happened at the kitchen, and she has a piece that she played. Um, oh, I'm so terrible with names. I can think of it when we take a break and I'll let you know. But she has one part where she plays the most magical ocarina playing. It's just like breathtaking. And I think she just went into the studio to record that. So super recommend checking out her playing. It's really great. I personally, as I said, you know, I sing while I'm performing for almost the entire time. Like sometimes not, but mostly all the time. So I really like having my mouth free so that I can sing. So if I'm, woo, you know, singing, playing an ocarina, then I can't sing. But I, I love some string and um, some wind instruments, brass instruments, you know, Love hearing people play them amazingly well. Um, moving down to Eleanor's uh, question, how did you in initially learn to play all these instruments? Um, a lot of this um, has been self-taught. And um, in terms of being self-taught, what that means is that um, I think there's quite a bit of a uh, propensity, at least in classical music, towards a kind of virtuosity. Like, let's see how many notes you can play on that instrument. Let's see how fast you can play it. Let's see how virtuosically you can play it. And that's the determinant of how great and amazing musician that you are. So I would like to expand that idea and say that um, I want instruments to be more egalitarian for everybody. That it's not like there's just like this narrow number of people who get to play them because they get quote unquote really good at them. Um, I also think that for people who have put their time into playing instruments, um, be it whatever the instruments are, they could be traditional ones, they could be ones that you made yourself, they could be um, virtual ones, they could be electronic ones. Um, your musicality, I think, doesn't go away no matter what the instrument is that you play. So I'm a big proponent and encourager of people to um, pick up new instruments. Pick up new instruments you've never put your hands on before. Pick up something that you don't know what it does and start messing with it and see what kind of sounds you can get out of it. See what happens with the instrument. Um, because I think those are very beautiful moments because it takes artists away from the ego, like you have something to prove, like, oh, listen to how amazing I am on this instrument. Like, what about the sound? What about what's happening when you put your hands or your mind onto whatever that thing is that you want to create sound out of? And uh, give yourself space and freedom to explore, you know? Um, I think it's exciting. I think one can find beautiful avenues to, um, you know, travel down and see what happens. So I'm, that's how I got the instruments. That's why I keep getting things. I have, um, you know, I'm perfectly fine with saying it's a brand new instrument and I'm figuring out the things on it and what it does. I don't want to ever get quote unquote comfortable. Um, yeah, that's for me being creative is about actually being uncomfortable. And we'll get to that with uh, more about that when I close at the very end. So let's see. Um, We've got about eight minutes left, and then um, I'm going to go through some things kind of like about my kind of tying in um, kind of my philosophy. I've touched on some of these things, but I'll put them into like a little bit more of a concise format. So I guess a bit of my philosophy, but with how I'm working is that um, my work is kind of time-based or manipulating time-based creative expression. Um, through a series of tensions and releases that are combined to create a journey for the listener over the course of the project um, or the event. And I'm really um, inspired by and committed to facilitating um, extraordinary transformative experiences. So when I say that, when I say extraordinary, I mean extraordinary, like out of the ordinary, take you out of the day-to-day process of regular life and facilitate a space that can be transformative. Um, so how that occurs for me is that um, it's important for me to be mindful about the spaces where work takes place and occurs. 
I'm going to get to more of this after we take the break and what that actually means. Like I said before, um, don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. Use everything that interests you and, you know, grab it with full gusto. Um, so um, another point I would say about what I do is I try to um, sensitize around different forms of narrative and use these variances for creating more tension and release. So what that means is that um, I will uh, use all different kinds of language. Sometimes the formats may sound like songs. Sometimes the format may sound like text. Sometimes what I like to do is, um, you know, exercises where maybe like I'll write a text and cut it up and recombine it and then make another whole kind of range that comes out of that, that then disrupts the traditional linear narrative that we're acclimated to in language. Um, I'll also, uh, because I'm working with the mouth and with singing and sound, I'll move sometimes from the clarity of a word, maybe repeat it until it shifts into pure sound and see what kinds of, and give space to listeners, participants to see where the sound, the language takes their imagination. So one of the things I've been doing in particular for, um, a piece that I'll talk about more in a little bit. Um, actually, you have to forgive me. I'm really not a like super linear person. I tend to talk about a lot of different things at the same time. So I'm going to be circling back a little bit. Um, there is another piece that fit into that category called the Multimedia Performance and Generative Installation Project Pieces. And that's another piece that I'm working on here, which is called the Totality of Blackness Trilogy. It has three parts. Uh, the first part is called Emerge from the Totality of Blackness. The second part is called Surrender to the Totality of Blackness. And the third part is called Resonate in the Totality of blackness. I um, was commissioned to make a virtual version of Surrender to the Totality of Blackness for CTM Festival Berlin that premiered, uh, gosh, this COVID time, everything is getting all amorphous and slippery with time. That happened in 2021 and January. And we will eventually um, present the live in-person version of that piece. Emerge from the Totality of Blackness was commissioned also by CTM in partnership conjunction with um, Savvy Contemporary Space in Berlin, and they were the hosts and were amazing in terms of supporting me. Um, Camilla Bentwali was my uh, curator. She was super great, had a beautiful team there, was really happy working with everybody. And um, so that piece is created. Although when I say created, I give myself always full license to change whatever I want to change amend things, develop things, hone things, shift them. So that was that particular iteration and I have things down on paper, but that may change over time. Um, I also have part three of the piece called Resonate in the Totality of Blackness, which I haven't written yet and I'm gonna work on that um, while I'm here in Paris. The piece was inspired by the Black Lives Matter movement. I wanted to find an artistic creative expression in response to that, so I wrote a piece uh, surrender, which is about um, reframing um, our, our notion of surrender um, so that we can look at it instead as a conscious choice to move through the perceived boundaries of separation towards intimacy and find uh, through four love songs that I wrote um, to the earth, the sea, the sky, and the universe to um, find love for blackness in its totality in everything that we experience so that we can get to the root of our psyches and do some deep interior work in that regard. Um, I have a longer article that um, I was very lucky to um, have Christina, Christine Cacaire, um to interview me and dialogue with me and she wrote a beautiful piece that's up on the CTM website. You can look into their archives there and read more that I wrote about the piece. Emerge from the Totality of Blackness is um, taking it back to the womb and uh, writing some um, so in imagining being in the womb and what kinds of um, language that we don't get to hear and soothing songs that we don't get to hear when we go from there out into the world to let us know that we are not really separate beings, but we're actually connected to everybody and everything in the universe. And then uh, resonate in the totality of blackness is going to be about what happens after we find that connection 
and that we're all ultimately connected through resonance. And uh, I'm going to be exploring some things around quantum entanglement, and uh, we'll see how that affects our relationship to it relative to imagina imagination and narrative, and also um, negotiating our in the world as of now relationship to how we engage with the whole sense of that we've got scientific proof that says, you know, this kind of science exists, but we can't perceive it with our senses. So what does that mean in a piece? So that'll be in that one. Um, just to finish up with this part, um, in terms of like the philosophy stuff, um, I've tried to sensitize myself more and more, continue to sensitize myself around sound. Um, I think it's important to feel free to, de to delve into any media that helps forward the creative expression. Um, I uh, encourage people to find their own unique expression, to trust your own voice. Uh, nobody will do what you do, so um, let the world have that. And I also think as an artist, it's really important to make time for good self-care. Um, I'm a firm proponent in daily meditation, which is not based to any kind of religion or spirituality per se, uh, as a mind-body practice. I think it's also really helpful for musicians in terms of um, holding your own feeling of time and space as you work, especially silence. I think it's really helpful. Um, I think it's important to exercise the body, eat well, rest, and be kind to yourself. Um, I believe that there are no mistakes. Um, there are only opportunities through uh, actions and chance for um, new, op new possibilities. Um, what I love about what I do is I get to be like the Wizard of Oz with the curtain open and occupy all the roles, melody, harmony, rhythm, percussion, sonic glazes, and real-time orchestration. So I'll leave everybody with that. That's an hour now. And uh, when we come back, I'm going to go through um, a few of the documents that I shared with you, and we can talk about what they mean and how they can be helpful for everybody's creative practices. OK, so should we maybe just put in those documents that you shared in case not everyone got them? Mm -hmm. um, and then was there some links you wanted to drop in? So we've got that one. Um, the two that you sent in advance, and then I'll the drop the other one in as well. Yes. So there's three. And I've got copies of those in front of me, but I think it's nice if everybody can look along with me if they want to, so that they can see, um, you know, what all is going on, what I'm talking about. So, so did you want to um, just talk a little bit more and maybe play those videos that you had queued up? Yes, I will. Um, um, that... Another 20 minutes or so, is that okay? And then we can open for questions. Oh, we have one actually question from Lara. I don't know if you wanted to take that now or. Okay, sure. Uh, Lara wanted you to say a bit more about generative processes. Okay, so um, I should qualify that each piece kind of has, I mean, they're all interconnected. I, the more I work, the more I re realize that I keep, you know, recircling around and revisiting different themes. Um, it's funny, years ago I read somewhere somebody said that a painter just keeps painting the same bowl of fruit or the same vase and flowers over and over again. And I've also heard corollary, corollaries that, you know, a writer just keeps writing the same story over and over again. I, you know, I don't know if that's the case, but um, I do find that there are curiosities that I have about particular qualities and elements and I keep circling back to them. So regarding um, chance, that came out of uh, that piece because I realized that when I realized that I could, with Traces and Numerological, when I realized I could play it in any order or in any direction, I was like, well, how do I choose? And then I just started riffing on that. Well, how do we choose anything? And then I was really interested in breaking through the fourth wall of this kind of traditional format of the performer and the audience. And I wanted everybody to find a way to participate because then if the audience chose what order the piece was in, but then they chose by chance, then it starts, you know, circling around all these different kind of ways that um, sound can be created, that performance can be created, that gesture can be created. Regarding generative processes, that applies more to this piece that I'm working on called The Magical Garden. And in particular with that one, what I was interested in is that 
I went uh, years ago to uh, see uh, Eno's 77 Million Paintings piece when uh, it was playing at the Brighton Festival. And it was in a dark room. And I was so intensely struck by how within five minutes into the piece, I was out like a light, but I was not asleep. It put me into some like really intense trance state. And when something touches me that deeply, I'm like, whoa, what's going on? So I kind of finally roused myself out of it after like, cause this is a generative piece and it just keeps going and going. And afterwards I roused myself out and I was like, oh, okay, that was intense. What is going on here? So I started listening. I was like, oh, there's particular things that he's doing. He's picking just three tonal centers, three nice instruments. And I was like, okay, once I start breaking this down, then it has me thinking, okay, what can you do if you're going to do something generatively? So from there, I took it to another level and I was like, well, I create these kind of scores. What would it be like if you had a score that could be both played as a performance and then become a generative piece? So I'm working with um, Matthew Ostrowski, who is, um, composer and artist in his own right and also master um you know technical advisor and programmer in maxim's pin jitter and uh we've been developing this piece and it's been interesting to do because we had to figure out kind of look at the piece and say okay what parameters are we going to use um what things are going to be generative and we ended up deciding that we're going to move different parts and different sections and then I had to think about the narrative. Well, how much can get moved? What order should it be in? I'll then add in more generative elements in terms of effects so that once it finishes in the performance, then what you hear afterwards um, will never be the same thing because it's working generatively. Um, that's kind of about as far as this, this, this work is in process. So we're going to see where it keeps going and developing. Um, and I'm really interested in immersive experiences. Um, I'm, I love making things where these fourth walls don't exist, where, um, with Surrender to the Totality of Blackness and all of those pieces, uh, they're not meant to be experienced with the person that, to look at, and then you sit in your chair. Surrender is meant to be experienced lying down on a cot so that you actually have the physical feeling of surrendering. Um, the video that goes along with that piece is not meant to be looked at on a wall. Instead, it's meant to cover every space, every surface in the space, the floors, the walls, the ceiling, the people, so that instead of looking at video as this thing that you look at, I want it to be a different kind of material that's something that you feel like you go up into. And that's a different kind of way of engaging, I think, with video than traditional formats where there's like this, you know, the rectangle, the screen, the thing that you look at. Not like people haven't done all kinds of amazing things moving out of that territory, but this is how that fits into these particular pieces. So I'm looking at our time. I want to be mindful. Did I, um, did that kind of get at what you were asking about? Was there anything else you wanted to know or? I think Lara is generally quite interested in, in generative processes and chance, so I think I think that's good for now and okay. maybe Lara, like, if you have a further question then yeah. mm -hmm. there'll be some time afterwards. Okay. So um let's uh move to the um document that says music and sound inquiry questions. So this document I ended up putting together because for the last several years I've been teaching at Bard College Berlin. They have an experimental, the devising experimental theater um, intensive uh, um, program that happens in the summers. So I do, I work with music and sound and I'm working with uh, theater people and because it's a devising theater um, program, what that means is that instead of there being the traditional roles of the playwright, the director, and the actors, um, everybody does everything. So they create everything together. So in the interest of that, all different kinds of practitioners are brought in to work with the students. And so in my doing music and sound, I wanted to um, come up with a format for people to really sensitize around sound and think about sound in different kinds of ways. So these might seem like pretty simple questions, but I find them actually really helpful when beginning a piece. 
um, or in any kind of creative format. And you can, you know, extend this and apply this to all kinds of things, light, material, gesture. This happens to be with sound. So I started out by saying, when you're making your piece, first to think about is where are you? Are you indoors or outdoors or both? And does that shift and change over time uh, over the course of your piece? Because your sound is going to sound really different indoors than it is being outdoors. So, um, and then depending on where you go, it can then shift and change over time. So if you're indoors, uh, what kind of room are you in and how is the sound? Is it echoey? Is it dry? Is it wet? Is it flat? Clap your hands and you can hear a certain amount of like, you know, slap back in the room that I'm in right now. But listen to the reverberation in the space. Walk around the space and see if that sound changes depending on where you are in the room. Um, next question, are you performing in a traditional theater? If so, where do you want to be and perform? On stage? In the audience space? In the balcony? in a combination of both spaces. Where do you want your audience to be? In the seats, on the stage, standing, sitting in the aisles, in the balcony. Um, if you're in a black box space, uh, where do you want to be and perform? Where do you want your audience to be? Do you want them to be horizontal, vertical? Do you want their positioning to change over time? How do you want this to occur? Um, what are your sound choices and where can they come from? The human voice, sound from objects, sound from musical instruments, recorded audio, tracks, track or tracks created pre previously, recorded audio rec created in real time, a combination of these elements. Um, where do, then where do you want your sound source choices to come from in the space you occupy? And, um, uh, oh, I wrote this a little bit wrong, there's a typo in there. And how, um, do, wait, do, do, yeah, oh, and do to, D-U-E to how you experience sound in the space. Um, do you uh, want the sound coming from a voice, from objects, from acoustic musical instruments, from speakers, from someplace else, um, maybe from uh, moving sculptural uh, objects that make sound, riffing here and thinking of other things that could be under objects. Um, where are um, the sound sources placed over time in your piece and do they move around? Because if the objects get moved, that can change how they sound in space. If the people who are playing move around, that can change how it sounds. Um, what are um, your choices in terms of where you choose to have the audience experience sound? Um, is the audience sitting on the stage or in the traditional audience space? Does the audience move? If so, how does their movement affect the sound that they hear? Um, do you want to include music? Because <laughs> you don't have to. You can do things with sound that may not have, you know, traditional, um, you know, categorizations of music in them. How does that affect um, that cho that affect the change of sound, energy, emotion, and narrative in what you create? Do you want to include a soundscape? How does that affect the change of sound, energy, emotion, narrative in what you create. Depending on the sound sources you've chosen, the body, synthetic instruments, other sound sources, inanimate objects, how do you want to organize those sounds? What systems do you want to use? Um, what software or apps do you want to use to create your sound? How can you organize that sound? Um, regarding, regarding recordings and sound, do you want to use, do you want your sound music soundscape to come from live sources? recorded linear recording sources, looping sources, what combination do you want to use? How do you want that to change over time? Um, then let's talk about silence relative to sound and, and sound, let's put it that way, not just relative to, but and sound. Where do you want silence? Where do you want sound? When do you want silence to emphasize sound when it comes in? Um, there are all kinds of different ways that we hear sound. I think, and I'm not, I'm putting this into categories, but it's just to start to delineate a bit. And it's not like those categories actually exist as, you know, hard boxes. So generally we've got like the primary sound and then you can have a secondary sound that's maybe a little bit lower underneath that sound. And then you can have tertiary sounds underneath that. And then you can have um, even sounds underneath that. And then we can have sounds that the ear can't even perceive, but that the body can feel. So, um, do you want 
a sound to be primary, the easiest thing to hear? Do you want the sound to be secondary underneath the primary sound? Do you want the sound to be tertiary under the secondary sound? Do you want these roles to shift and change over time? If so, when and where? Um, and then what ranges of sound um, do you want to alter over time relative to the loudness, softness, silence, consonants, dissonance, density, sparseness, roughness, smoothness. I'm just giving you like some, some ranges of qualities to sensitize around and be mindful about. So um, the last thing that I have on this um, page is um, active and passive roles, actors and audience. Um, it's a little bit framed towards theater, but it really kind of applies, I think, in any situation. Um, who's participating? Who's watching? What happens when you shift and dislocate those roles over time? Because you can do that. There is nothing that says that anything has to be any one way. So um, I uh, am going to, uh, let's see, leave that there. And then I want to come back to a piece, which was the CTM piece. And um, we can play that. And you can hear what I did with this piece. So, you know, we've all been going through our challenges with COVID times. And especially for musicians, it's been really challenging because we can't be in person with everybody to do our work the way that we'd like to. So a lot of this has included pivoting into virtual format. So CTM Festival asked me to make a virtual version of Surrender to the Totality of Blackness. So the piece is intended to be presented in a black box space, like I said, with everybody lying down on cots. One of the considerations I had to make was like where to place the speakers, because if a person is sitting in a chair in a traditional formatted um, hall, oftentimes things will be stationary and they'll have their sound system there. It'll be in a stereo format. Some places may have surround, but there may be this kind of presumed idea that the audience is to be kind of sitting upright. But if the audience is lying down, then their ears are in a totally different place. So we're going to have to place the speakers much lower so that they catch people's ears. And I'm also going to have speakers hanging from the ceiling so that um, people will feel the sound coming down upon them. Now where this gets interesting is I've been working with ambisonic technology. Um, what that means is you've got surround sound that then you can manipulate it through um, virtual software. There are all different kinds of companies that do this um, for up until now I've been working um, with a um, company based out of um, San Francisco called Envelope. Um, it's freeware. Uh, you can go to their soft their website download it. Um, and you can run it in Ableton Live as um, Max for Live uh, patches. Um, so they also do a binaural version. So what that means is it's um, you hear it in earbuds. So I made a binaural version of the piece, and then I came up with video. And if you can imagine, when you watch the video, imagine that you are inside of the video. That it's all over you, it's in the room, uh, it's on the ceiling, it's on the walls, it's on the floor, it's on you. And um, I think hopefully you should be able to hear some of the binar binary, uh, the binaural um, ambisonics. So if you have on any kind of earphones or earbuds that you can grab, um, you can put those on and that'll make it easier for their, you to hear that. So. Um, Let's start the piece maybe, we're not going to listen to the whole thing. Let's start about, I'd say, three minutes and 35 seconds in. I think that's good. Because I want you to get a sense of two different parts. This is going to be the part with the sky and the part with the universe. Um, I wrote these love songs to um, the earth and the sea, the sky and the universe, asking for intimacy with them. Um, and... Uh, Let's see what we have going on here. This is the end. So if we, yeah, that looks good. Cool. Sorry, um, let's go back a little bit more because I realized you missed the first part. So take it back maybe a minute to maybe like 2.30 and so that we can at least see what the sky part looks like. Sorry about that. I so let's start there, that's good. Yeah, thanks.
Okay, so that's a short excerpt. Um, you can find um, the entire piece online. I'm pretty sure that it is still up on the CTM um, uh, YouTube website. 
So this particular piece, um, one of the things I was doing was doing really slow, elongated singing because I wanted the words to be really subtle and I wanted them to be things that just kind of creep into your psyche and consciousness and not just like, you know, right over the head. So that um, piece uh, hopefully will be presented um, maybe, you know, fingers crossed, next year. We'll see. You know, it's all up in the air with the COVID these days. So um, I would like to close out uh, with two quotes. And I gave you um, these, which I think are kind of applicable to, ev to anybody and everybody. So when I was um, talking about what I do, um, I was saying that, um, you know, I said, don't throw out the baby with the bathwater, use everything that interests you. And um, the artist Saul Lewitt was good friends with Eva Hess, and they wrote to each other back in the day. And um, in a moment of encouragement, Saul Lewitt uh, wrote to Eva Hess, and he said, stop it and just do. Try and tickle something inside you, your weird humor, in quotes. You belong to the most secret part of you. Don't worry about being cool. Make your own uncool. You are not responsible for the world. You are only responsible for your work. So do it. And don't think that your work has to conform to any preconceived form, idea, or flavor. It can be anything you want it to be. So the reason why it's important to do your own thing, I think comes from the final quote that I'm gonna leave you with, which is another letter that Agnes DeMille, who was the grand dame of starting American Modern Dance, um, in her format, uh, she was good friends with Agnes DeMille, who was the choreographer, who was famous for a lot of the um, big uh, Technicolor um, Hollywood musicals, then uh, the beautiful tap dancing with people like Ginger Rogers and Fred Astaire. So she was having a moment of crisis and um, Arthur Graham um, being, you know, her beautifully didactic self wrote this letter to Agnes DeMille and she said, there is a vitality, a life force, a quickening that is translated through you into action. And because there is only one of you in all time, this expression is unique. And if you block it, it will never exist through any other medium and be lost. The world will not have it. It is not your business to determine how good it is, nor how valuable it is, nor how it compares with other expressions. It is your business to keep it yours clearly and directly to keep the channel open. You do not even have to believe in yourself or your work. You have to keep open and aware directly to the urges that motivate you. Keep the channel open. No artist is pleased. There is no satisfaction whatever at any time. There is only a queer divine dissatisfaction, a blessed unrest that keeps us marching and makes us more alive. Now, more, Martha Graham said at the end, more alive than the others, and that's the only part that, you know, I diverge a bit because I don't like being that hierarchical and elitist feeling. So I want to just say more alive in general and that potentially everybody has access to this. So um, I'm going to leave you kind of closing with that for today. And now I want to open up um, the floor to dialogue, questions, comments, thoughts, um, inspirations, ideas, you know, lay it on us. Love to hear. What do you think? Thank you so much, Christina. And those resources you shared with us are fantastic and I think can apply to everyone, whatever their practices are. And I know we've got a real range of practices in the room amongst the students and I'm sure amongst the guests as well. Um, I don't know if we had any students who have prepared questions for Christina who want to go. Sorry, hold on. No worries. <laughs> who wanted to go first or we can just open it up directly um, please just like kind of put on your microphone um, or hand because we had I think Anya and Tom yeah. so Tom, I'm not sure. Thomas and I did oh. prepare some few questions but if, if people want to you know just throw some questions out there I'm sure it would be fine <laughs> oh but if you prepared some then let's maybe let's have at least one okay. or two of those if yeah, yeah sure. please go ahead thank you yeah, yeah. um anya do you want to share or i can uh sure if i can find out how to do it <laughs> maybe um, oh maybe yeah we just it. need to allow you to share um okay michael can do that for you anya should be 
possible for everyone. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I think so, yeah. It's this one. Yeah. Can people see that? Oh, there you go. That there is, go. Uh, that's from the Q&A. Um, yeah, there we go. <laughs> um, Tom, do you want to read? Do you want to start? Sure, start? Yeah, sure. Okay. Uh, so the first question, once you have created something for yourself, what pushes you to broadcast your art to an audience? Um, do you feel it's a necessary part of the creative process? Now, when you say broadcast, do you mean like broadcast over like radio, internet, or do you just mean general? No. Presented so out just, I guess, letting it out of your, your own, yeah, letting yeah. it into the world with, with other people. A lot of those questions come from the, the documents that you shared, and this was kind of an answer to, you know, this being true to yourself and making art for yourself, because an essential part of being an artist is also sharing that. So once you've done it for yourself, then is there what pushes you to think, let's give it to someone else as well, and how do you fit that into a creative process without, yeah, but we'll say true to yourself. Um, let's see, I think that... Uh, I generally make things in very specific formats to be presented out in the, to the world. I mean, I can still, you know, sing to myself while I'm in the kitchen, which is, you know, also beautiful and lovely and a satisfying thing. But I enjoy um, making things and sharing them uh, with people in the world because, like that Martha Graham uh, quote said, you know, these I, I, these moments they're unique, and so that's another reason why I really like. Um, doing improvised music and making improvised work is that it is never the same every time. It's always something new. So you got to be there to experience it. Um, I don't think I ever was in a situation where I, you know, you have to understand, I've been like getting up on a stage so probably since I was like three years old. So um, I've always been in environments where I was sharing things that I was doing and performing with other people. That said, you know, as you can hear from what I'm sharing, you know, the context in which that occurs has shifted dramatically. So um, I'm not just getting up on a stage. I'm making pieces in different kinds of ways and I'm exploring the different kinds of ways that we can come together um, and share, as I said, um, extraordinary uh, tra uh, transformative experiences. Is it, is it a necessary part of the creative process? I think everybody has to decide for themselves what and where and how um, that fits into their own practice. You know, I very much um, can be in the moment while I'm in the studio making something and have, you know, challenge and joy and pleasure out of that. Um, and I also, I like being with people and sharing with people. So, I mean, maybe it comes from the fact that I was an only child and I wanted siblings when I was growing up, I don't know. So that's kind of like my, you know, riffing response to your question. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Okay. Um, um, yeah, again, kind of riffing off that the letter to Ernesto Ville that you sent, do you find it difficult to stay true to your unique impression while also having an audience and working within the music industry, labels, concert venues, etc. Because you do have certain standards, right? That you have to fit. Um, well, my standards are, I'm always pushing myself to expand beyond my comfort zone. Uh, you know, that, that queer divine dissatisfaction I was talking about, that quote, you know, and I don't ever want to be comfortable. I always want to be looking and searching and exploring and you know, a lot of my work now is coming into the area of inquiry. And when I say inquiry, I don't mean inquiry like questions and answers like two plus two equals four. What I mean is in inquiry as in questions to observe. For example, there's a rock. Lift up the rock. What do you see? And then you can lift up the rock and be like, okay, well, there's, you know, some lichen underneath here. There's some earth. There's some minerals. There's some little you know, bugs and critters running around, is that cool? And then from lifting up that one rock, you can say, oh, there's a rock over there, let me see what's under that. And then you can look under that rock and you might find, say, well, there's some things similar, but there were some things different here. And then maybe you look at a third rock and say, oh, that one's a completely different color. Why is that a different color? And you realize it's because it's being dripped on by something from a tree. And then you look up at the tree and then you say, oh, wow, look at those leaves. How did the what? So I find that that kind of inquiry can lead us in um, unanticipated paths to uncover things that we may not have expected. And that is where the extraordinary kind of um, insights and observations and um, 
items can come from. Um, within the music industry, labels, concerts, venues, etc., there are limitations. Like for example, I, in the um, the music and sound inquiry page that I gave, you could conceivably be in a venue that for fire purposes doesn't allow you to let the audience move and run around. It may have limitations that way. So, you know, there are the ideals and then there's the reality of what we want to deal with and then everybody has their own choices. They may decide, well, I don't want to work in that space because that doesn't allow me to fulfill what I want to do. Um, and everybody has to make their own individual choices. Um, that shifts and changes over time um, for myself. In terms of labels, um, I have recorded things for other people. I started my own label because I wanted to put my own music out and I didn't want to have to have people um, uh, tell me when it could or couldn't come out or you know, pull the plug on something because somebody stopped working at the label, stuff like that. Um, uh, in terms of venues, uh, I have sometimes particular visions for how I want things to get performed. Sometimes it's opportunity, um, you know, and there end up being compromises because unfortunately we live in a capitalist world and we are limited by budgets and what we can get access to. So, you know, I have to live with them and say, well, either I'm going to do this or I don't want to do this and I want to get my work out into the world. Um, I'm very mindful and conscious about the passing of time and that um, I want people to be able to share with me and experiencing um, these events and environments that I'm um, trying to facilitate. So I don't know if that answers your question. Or not. Oh, okay. good. Yeah. Okay. Oh, you kind of already yeah answered yeah. that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Do I always? So do you want to go to the next? Yeah, I'll just go to the next one. Or, okay. Well, I could yeah. answer that question. Do I always go through the? Um, process consciously. Mm -hmm. I think because I came up with the questions, there are things that are generally at the back of my mind. I will say that for not just for other people, but for myself, I it's great for me to have printed out this page again to be looking at it right now because I do find that it can be super helpful, especially getting started. When you have a piece and you're on the blank page and you're like, where do I start? These are some good questions to the potentially to pull out and decide, okay, in this particular moment, for this particular period of time, I want to um, try and use this. I want to try and do this, and let's see what happens. Um, yeah. Okay. All right. Thank yeah, you. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. We do tend to forget about the simple, uh, the simple tools that that do help us. Yeah. A lot. Um, so the next question: When listening to your music, I felt clear references to environmental soundscapes and experiences of a a kind of connection with something wider these and i guess you've referenced these uh trying to create transformative experiences for people mm -hmm. so are you inspired um are you kind of inspired by these experiences by that you have by yourself something beyond culture and music um and how do you materialize those feelings into music and sound okay so in answer i'm looking at what you um Put down that you're asking so you felt so you um felt clear references to environmental soundscapes and experiences of connection mm -hmm. to the wider world so this does this has been a, a theme that um keeps recurring in my work which is that i think as human beings we have a propensity to um put things into categories and boxes like it's this or that and um especially you know these days um you know, moving beyond the binary, I think, is something that can be um, much more expansive for how we express ourselves, how we perceive the world. Um, I also, uh, looking at what you're saying and thinking and talking at the same time out loud. Um, yeah, um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm engaged in this inquiry, like we are in these physical bodies that we perceive as separate, but the reality is that we are made from the carbon of the stars, our energy connects through to the outermost part of the universe. Um, and we are all connected. And I think especially in like our 21st century um, times that, you know, environmental and climate uh, change issues are very real. And um, I think it's important for us to move beyond capitalist systems and see how we're going to connect with the planet. Because if we're going to keep being here, we got to um, find a way, I think, to transform that relationship. So, um, yeah, I think the wider world and 
uh, the environment and climate change issues um, motivate me as well these days. And how do I materialize these feelings into music and sound? Um, I try to be mindful about silence and space. Um, I try to give room in terms of narrative words and content for people to have an opportunity to move in and out of the realm of um, words as narrative linear content for what we're kind of presumed that words are supposed to do and give people space for their imaginations to take them where um, they could go um, maybe outside of their perceptions in the physical world through to wherever their imagination takes them. Thank you. Yeah, that's really, yeah, that's thank really you very much. Thank you. Do you want me to say anything more about that? Is that good? Okay. I think we're going to have to have maybe the last question now. So I don't know if Anya and Tom, you want to choose one if you've got several more remaining. I'm afraid we'll have to. Uh, I think this shortly. is the last time. I wouldn't mind you confirming, Tom. This is the last ones, right? This is the last that we yeah, came good. up with. Yeah. Okay. How do I know I want to collaborate with somebody? Oftentimes it happens quite spontaneously. I'll hear somebody's music and I love it. And then I meet them and we have a good vibe. And I'm like, let's get together and try something we do. And it's great. Um, is it a very different process to working on your own projects? Oh, absolutely. Got to give lots of space for other people. It's engagement, it's play, it's dialogue, it's, um, ex it's exchange beyond just the two and outward with what becomes out of the joining and the being together. Um, how do I get in contact with people for working together? Oftentimes we meet each other pretty organically. You know, I'll be at one of their concerts or their gigs, they'll come to one of mine, there'll be a situation where a colleague will bring us all together, then we'll say, let's branch out and try something else. Um, and, you know, I'm a pretty, you know, warm, friendly person, and I'll go up and be introduce someone or go and introduce myself and say, that's awesome, you want to try and do something, and then I'll send them their music, my music or links, and if they vibe with it, then we'll decide to get together. So that's how that's happened. Great, thank you. You're welcome. Yep, that's it for us. Thank you very much. Okay. Thanks so much, Tom and Anya, and for the answers as well, Christine. I think because a lot of that does seem quite kind of cryptic and strange, and you know, like, how do people meet each other? How do people collaborate? How how does all this stuff happen? How do you come to be with all these amazing instruments that you described? Um, but I think, yeah, you've given us a good. Um, behind the scenes kind of understanding of your your artistic and creative processes um, and that kind of openness I guess nurturing that openness and fearlessness um, and I guess pushing back against like you said ideas of virtuosity and yeah preciousness I think that keeps on coming up actually um, quite often in this series um, so hopefully students are getting the message um, yeah, do it, do it, do <laughs> the thing, get it out in the world. We need to hear it. If you don't do it, the world won't get it, so do it. <laughs> exactly. Okay, um, so I'm afraid, I think we need to wrap up there unless anyone has a really quick question before we go. But I, th I think because you left quite a lot of time in between yes. um, while she was speaking, hopefully people have um, got, got the main ones out. All right, so we'll wrap up there. Thank you so much, Christina, thank um, you for, having for your talk. Me. Thank you for um, everybody with the staff and the crew. Everybody's been so great. Thank you all the wonderful course participants who are here today. I so appreciate your making the time and you know holding the space, offering your listening, bringing your brilliant, lovely, wonderful questions, and just engaging and being here. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to share all this. I hope that it inspires you to go and do your thing out in the world and let us hear it and experience it. Amazing. And good luck with the rest of your residency in Paris. That sounds very exciting. Okay. Thanks everyone. Um, so we'll see each other next week where we have um, Holly Buhagie as our guest. So take care and see you then. Okay. Thanks everybody. Bye Christina. Bye. Great take care. You. Take care. Okay.